Okay, cool. Thank you. Happy New Year, Cornerstone. Woo! There's only, I guess, one Sunday we could say that, and uh, I'm the announcer today, so yes, I'm so pumped. Um, every time I do announcements, I like to bring it back to uh, a purpose for why we gather. Uh, what, what are we doing here in the first place? Um, and of course, there are a variety of reasons, but earlier this week uh, in my devotional uh, with God Daily, they pointed out something about the raising of Lazarus I hadn't seen before, and it reminded me of our church and why we gather, why we walk through this life together. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I just want to read the ending of that story where, um, as you guys remember, uh, Jesus was a few days out um, from where Lazarus was, and messengers had been sent to Jesus and said, the one who you love is sick. And Jesus waited a few days and then traveled there, and then he learned that Lazarus had passed away. And that's where the famous um, shortest verse in the Bible comes from, Jesus wept. And, uh, and then he goes to the, the burial site, and uh, he goes to the tomb, and uh, it says, He cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. And wow, what a miracle. And that's often like where my brain just kind of ends the story. Like, wow, Lazarus was risen from the dead. Amazing. But the story actually doesn't end there. Um, it goes on to say that Lazarus's hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, uh, the community around Lazarus, unbind him and let him go. And so even though Jesus has, had raised Lazarus from the dead, the work wasn't done yet. Jesus commanded the community around Lazarus to unbind him from the strips of cloth that marked him as dead. And now he's being brought from d the dead into life, into new life with Jesus. And so that really stuck out to me, and that reminded me of why we gather as a church. We are called, we are commanded by Jesus to help one another be brought fully, to experience fully this new life that we now live. And uh, so... I just want to invite you to say to your neighbor, uh, just like they said of Lazarus, uh, that, that Lazarus is the one who Jesus loved. I would love you to turn to a neighbor and say, you are the one that Jesus loves. <laughs> All right. And then turn to another neighbor and say, I am here for you. Thank you, Sebastian. Perfect. Yeah, Lazarus's community had a role to play in his regeneration and being brought to life. And we are meant to live this life together. And uh, I've certainly experienced that uh, throughout my life in the church in general, but also here at Cornerstone Community Church. Our, and it's in our name too, community. We are, we are meant to live this together. Um, so I actually don't have too many announcements to share today, uh, but the way that we live out community just on Sunday mornings is that we have uh, second hour programs after our regular service that you are invited to participate in. The first Sunday of the month, we don't meet for second hour. We invite people to go grab lunch together, again, live life together. Um, but then on the second Sunday of the month, for second hour, we have uh, our worship collective. So if you'd like to meet with our worship team, uh, if you're interested in getting more involved in the setup and the teardown, uh, if you're not musically inclined, even if you're not technically inclined, there's definitely a role that you can play in just the, the Sunday service. Um, and then the third and fourth Sunday, we have Sunday school classes for children's ministries and adult ministries as well. And then if there is a fifth Sunday of the month, we meet for a church lunch, which is really awesome. You don't want to miss those. Um, so with that, I'd like to invite Mike up to uh, open us in a word of prayer. 
Good morning, Cornerstone. Let's pray. Father, we gather today to give you thanks and praise. For you created the heavens and the earth and all that is in it. You are perfect in all of your ways, and there is none like you. We give thanks for a new year, a new season for change, challenges, and praises. Above all, a new season to draw ever nearer to you. Only you know what shall become of each of us this new year, as this new year dawns. So we trust in you. Your ways are perfect. So in all things, in all circumstances, we can trust in you. Father, let us begin by confessing anything that displeases you. And hear our prayers, O God, and forgive us. Lord, I ask this new year that his wisdom calls beckoning us to listen. We are obedient to hear you. As is written in the Proverbs, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and I find knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogance, the evil way, and the perverted mouth. I hate. Advice is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. Power is mine. Lord, in this new year, may we listen for your voice of wisdom that guides us in the paths of righteousness. Be gracious to us when we fall. Convict us when we sin. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. Blessed be your name when we are found in the desert place. In everything, in all circumstances, may we seek your face. In everything, and in all circumstances, may we praise your name. And in everything, and in all circumstances, may you receive glory and honor and praise. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Cornerstone. Please rise for the reading of our Lord's Word. Ruth 1, 1 to 5. In the days when judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name, wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Mahalon and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab to live there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah, the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilion died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. The word of our Lord. Thank you. reflect on the uh, first week of the new year. And should anything that comes up, any distraction, any obstacle, any sin that would prevent you from worshiping this morning, Let's take a moment and cast those off. also encourage us this morning any uh, any burdens anything that would weigh heavily on your heart on your shoulders this morning let's lift those up in prayer as well
Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sunday and opportunity to gather together in your name. Pray that the songs that we sing would bring delight to your heart. That you would be pleased with our offering. Lord, we pray that anything that would distract us this morning from worshiping you, cast those on and lift those up in prayer. Fully knowing and trusting that all aspects of our lives are in your hands. That you provide and we have no need. And God, we ask that this morning the songs that we sing, the words that flow from our lips would be a reflection of our hearts and the desires of our hearts. We pray that the Holy Spirit would lead us in worship this day, that we would genuinely follow after his leading. We thank you, God, for all things. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Before the day, before the light, before the world revolved around the sun, God on high stepped down into time and wrote the story of his love for everyone. He has filled our hearts with wonder So that we always remember You and I are made to worship You and I are called to love You and I are forgiven and free When you and I embrace surrender you and I choose to believe, and you and I will see who we were meant to be. Oh, sorry, I was trying to be uh, slick about it. I need a new battery. Thanks. <laughs> Sing all we are, all we are, and all we have is all a gift from God that we receive. Brought to life, we open up our eyes to see the majesty and glory of the King. He has filled our hearts with wonder So that we always remember You and I are made to worship You and I are called to love You and I are forgiven and free When you and I embrace surrender You and I choose to believe then you and I will see who we were meant to be. Even the rocks cry out, even the heavens shout at the sound of his holy name. So let every voice sing out, let every knee bow down. He is worthy of all our praise. You and I are made to worship. You and I are called to love. You and I are forgiven and free. 
You and I embrace surrender. You and I choose to believe. Then you and I will see who we were meant to be. forgiven and free. You and I embrace surrender. You and I choose to believe. Then you and I will see who we were meant to be. Some Father writes, Father of light, you delight in your children. Sing that again. Father lights you delight in your church and your children and your people. Good and perfect gift comes from you. Every good and perfect gift comes from you. Sing every good and perfect gift. Every good perfect gift comes from you. Every good and perfect. Every from you Father of light Sing Father of lights you never change you have no turning Father of lights you never change you have no turning Father of lights. Father of lights, you never change. You have no turning. Same yesterday, today, forever. Every good, every good and perfect gift comes from you. Every good and perfect gift comes from you. Every gift and perfect gift comes from you. Father of Light. 
say, Father of lights. Oh, Father of lights. Sing that again. Father of lights. Oh, Father of lights. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Sing that again. You are. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. I've heard a thousand stories of what of love in the dead of night you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you it's who
adore Thee. time to our triune God. God in three. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Amen. Before you uh, sit down, turn to a neighbor. Greet him. Good morning. Avenue. 
As I was driving up Torrance Avenue, I saw a bridge open, blocking my way because a barge was coming through. I sat there and thought to myself about my choices. Maybe if I would have just committed to the highway, I would have gotten here on time. Maybe the traffic jam wasn't as bad as it seemed, but I made a choice. And every day we have to make choices. So we begin this morning with a poem by Tess Gallagher. And the title of this poem is simply Choices. She says, I go to the mountainside of the house to cut saplings so I can have a clear view of the snow on the mountain peaks. But when I look up with my saw in my hand, I see a nest clutched in the uppermost branches of the tree. So I don't cut that one. And I don't cut the others either. Because suddenly in every tree, an unseen nest or a mountain Tess could have chosen to demolish the beauty that was right there in front of her, trying to get a glimpse of the beauty that lay far beyond her horizon. But she chose instead to enjoy what she had instead of coveting what she did not have. She decided to enjoy the beauty of the branches, the beauty of the nest, instead of cutting away that beauty, looking for something else. The main character in the first three verses of this book of Ruth is a man by the name of Elimelech. And Elimelech has chosen to do exactly the opposite. He chose to cut his losses, uproot his family in search of a better life. Because apparently he didn't think that being in God's will would produce the kind of life he envisioned for himself or for his family. So it happened during the days when the judges governed, the text says. The days of the judges were days that were marked by violence and lawlessness, hostility and sinfulness, the days between the passing of Joshua and the crowning of Saul. Days of sinfulness and hostility. Judges chapter 21, 25 tells us that these were the days when everyone did as they saw fit. It was a chaotic time. The days of Deborah, the days of Barak, the days of Gideon, the days of Jephthah and of Samson. And especially the days of Ehud, the judge, who introduced the worship of Baal into Israel. These were sinful, dangerous, chaotic times in Israel. There was no central authority in the land. These judges reigned in different parts all over the nation of Israel. And most of these judges, like Samson, were distracted by everything except for governing the house of Israel. Almost every one of the judges, all of these leaders had character flaws that made them ineffective leaders, and it showed. There was no order in Israel. Now you remember the, day, the, the, the story in the book of Exodus. When Pharaoh had a dream, I'm sorry, the book of Genesis, when Pharaoh had a dream, and he called for his magicians to tell him what the dream meant. All of his magicians couldn't answer or interpret his dream. But Pharaoh sent for Joseph, who was in prison. Joseph came and interpreted the dream and said, Pharaoh, what this dream means is that you're about to have seven years of lean, seven years of amazing growth, but then you're going to have seven years of famine and drought. And so Joseph advised Pharaoh and said, this is what you do. For the next seven years, just store up grain to get ready for your seven years of famine and the famine won't affect the Egyptians at all and the plan worked. God was with him. And this is what happens when there are men and women of God standing on the wall. 
But the judges were too busy. And Gideon, one of the only ones who was fit to lead, he came into power doing a war. And so he didn't have administration on his mind. He was trying to fight battles. For all intents and all good purposes, the judges were absent. There was no leadership. They were not hearing from God. So it's no wonder then that during the reign of the judges, the Bible says here that there was a famine in the land. It's the first famine that is recorded in Israel's history since its founding. And it was on the watch of the judges that this famine occurred. They had seen no signs of a coming famine. They had stored no grain. Somewhere in the back of the Jewish mind, they all understood that this may be a judgment that is coming to us from God. Deuteronomy chapter 28 explained that famine was one of God's judgments. That he promised to bring upon the people if they were unfaithful to him. And so this is the setting of the first decision in the book of Ruth. It is a time of chaos, a time of unfaithfulness. And they're experiencing a God-ordained famine. But there was a man, the Bible says, of Bethlehem in Judah. Who had other ideas. The Bible says here that he chose to go and reside in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. He chose to leave Bethlehem, which ironically means the house of bread. Since there was no bread, he decides to leave and go into a foreign land. This was his decision to leave his home. To leave the people of God, to go and find grain somewhere else. And this decision seems practical enough. It's rather practical in my opinion. There is a famine in my hometown, so I move into another very practical response. And for the people who do not know God, this would seem to be the best option. This is my first point. Followers of God should not make their decisions based purely on practicality. Just because a decision seems practical does not mean it is God's will for me. Just because a choice is convenient does not mean that it's the right choice in my situation. Some believers make life choices according to what seems to feel right. There isn't always anything wrong with making decisions in this way. Sometimes my senses are right on point. But believers should take extra care, especially in making life-shaping decisions, to put out some spiritual feelers, while at the same time sensing the times and the seasons. We should employ discernment alongside common sense, and best practice. Believers should not make decisions based on practicality alone. And we should not turn to the left or to the right. We should not make any decisions until we are confident that our choices are in alignment with God's will. And the truth of the matter is that God's will is not very easy to know. But in this man's case, it was clearly spelled out in the scriptures. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, Moses decreed that Moabites were not permitted for a period of 10 generations even to enter the Lord's assembly. In other words, Israel was not to fraternize with the Moabites for 10 generations. It's clearly spelled out. In fact, it was during the time of the reign of the judges that the Moabites were at war with Israel. They were the enemies of Israel. And this man has decided to go and pitch his tent with Israel's enemies. Now because there is chaos, because there is famine at home, this man chooses to go and dwell as an alien and a dependent upon a nation that is hostile to his people. What a choice. 
And at the very least, we can say that this was an unwise choice. I won't, I won't go as far as many commentators, especially Jewish commentators, I won't go so far as to say it was a sinful choice. I don't know that. The text doesn't say that. But in rabbinical circles, the rabbis believe that this man was arrogant and evil. But the writer of the book of Ruth does not say that. He just made a choice. And the name of this man was Elimelech. His name means God is king. What an irony. And the name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malone and Chilion. They were Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judah. So they entered the land of Moab and they remained there. Elimelech is what you probably would call a good man. He's trying to find a way to provide for his family during these difficult years. But according to the book of Deuteronomy, God promised the people that if you will repent, I'll withdraw my anger and I will lift the famine off of you. All you need to do, Elimelech, is repent. But instead, Elimelech designed his own solution instead of calling on the mercies of God. Why did he do this? Why did he make this decision without consulting with his God? Because Elimelech, like many of us, Elimelech was under pressure. He felt like his situation was too urgent to wait on God. Have you ever been there? Where the situation is too pressing to wait for an answer from on high. I need to make a decision now. I'm under pressure. I'm under fire. His life was on the line. He felt that a decision needed to be made immediately. Stress and pressure, stress and pressure are two leading causes of disobedience to God. I'll say it again. Stress and pressure are the two leading causes of disobedience to God. What does it say about Elimelech that when the going got tough, he didn't turn to God? What does this say about him? Well, this says about Elimelech the same thing that it says about too many believers today. That the faith in God that we claim in good days does not apply when life gets hard. It is very concerning to me just how many followers of Jesus Christ so easily forsake him when the rubber meets the road. Fair weather Christians who depend on God to order their steps normally, but only as long as those steps lead to their comfort. Huh. Elimelech is running away from hard times. And as much as I hate to, I can relate to his dilemma. I understand the pressure and I can see how he could come to this conclusion. But I've been walking with God long enough now to have learned a very valuable lesson that I pass on to you today. That when a believer makes decisions in response to pressure, instead of out of obedience to God's word or in faith, more often than not, that decision will lead to calamity. And if that's not the case, sometimes the decision will have little to no positive impact on your situation anyway. Elimelech is running for his life, trying to escape the famine because he does not want to die. Right? That's his only motivation, survival. That's no small thing. We all want to survive. We all want to live comfortably, right? But this cannot be the primary motivation for the believer. Followers of Jesus Christ live for something more than self-gratification. We live for something more than comfort and for peace. We live for something greater. Followers of Jesus Christ live to bring glory to our God, whether in suffering or by victorious living. 
Our main goal is to ensure that in every circumstance, God is glorified in this world by our lives. It's all about the glory of God. This is our top priority. Not our survival and not our comfort, but that God would be glorified. But too often, in the heat of the moment, when we're under pressure, we fold. And we revert to worldly wisdom to help us survive those moments of crises. We live our lives trying to avoid trouble, running away from conflict. But we can learn a lesson here from Elimelech's decision. And the lesson we learn today is that there are some troubles, brothers and sisters, there are some troubles that we simply cannot avoid. And in short order, this narrator tells us the results of Elimelech's hasty and uninformed decision. Verse 3 says, then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. Whoa. <laughs> it was the very thing he was hoping to avoid. The very thing he was running from found him in the place that he deemed to be safe. Hmm. Elimelech died running from death. There are some situations in life that you simply cannot avoid. One could argue here that this is a sign of God's judgment on Elimelech. But I won't say that. The, the, the narrator doesn't say that. Death is coincidental. Death is a part of life. To say it another way, death is the consequence of living. You can't avoid it. And there are many things in life, many experiences, many difficult situations you simply cannot, you simply will not avoid. There are some storms you simply have to live through, some burdens you simply have to bear. And it is only by regular consultation with our God that you become equipped to discern which fires in your life you need to address and when you should just let the fire burn itself out. Let me say that again. <laughs> I think that's very important. As you remain in regular consultation with God, you will become equipped to discern which fires in your life you need to address and which fires you can just let burn themselves out. Don't try to put out every fire. You don't need to resolve every life discrepancy. And you will not be relieved of every pain and of every hurt on this side of heaven. Some suffering you're just going to have to go through. It's better to embrace it than to run. I am reminded of Paul's dilemma he described in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and I'm going to read it to you. Paul says this, Paul says, I know a man in Christ. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Such a man was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which a man is not even permitted to speak. Wow. What an experience. But Paul continues and says this. Because of the extraordinary greatness of the revelations that he received, for this reason, to keep Paul from getting exalted above himself, there was given to me, Paul says, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Listen to that. To keep me from exalting myself. And so what did Paul do in response? Paul didn't run from the thorn. He took it to God and he pleaded, he says, I pleaded with the Lord three times that this pain, this suffering that I'm going through, that I might be relieved of it, that this suffering would leave me. And Paul testifies that Jesus said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, 
for power is perfected in weakness. In other words, Paul, there are some things you just have to learn to live with. Because some pain has divine purpose. If Paul could have run far enough, if Paul could have run fast enough, I'm sure he would have. But Paul understood that if this pain is being caused by God, I will not be able to escape it. So instead, Paul embraces his suffering. He concludes, most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Jesus Christ may dwell in me. I may as well learn to embrace this. I may as well learn to love my pain. I may as well learn to appreciate my suffering if it means that Christ dwells more richly in me. Let me tell you something today. If you have a spiritual gift, and if you believe that God has great designs for you and for your ministry in this world, you may as well buckle your seatbelt and get ready because suffering is a part of promotion. One minute Paul is saying he's up in the third heaven being promoted by God. The next minute he's down in the dust, broken with a thorn in his flesh. And while everything in him wants to run away, he says, before I make any decisions of how I'm going to address this situation, I am going to consult my God. In the midst of his pressure, he says, I'm not going to allow pressure to force me to make bad decisions. Instead, I'll call upon the name of the Lord. And the word of the Lord came to him and said, son, some, some things, some things you just got to deal with. The greater lesson that we can learn from Paul's experience here is that the source of some of our troubles is God himself. Hmm. Say it again. The source of some of our struggles and our pain is God himself. And God troubles us in various seasons of our lives for our own growth and for our good. Sometimes God sends pain into our lives to prune us of dead spiritual weight, to clean us up, to get us ready and prepare us for greater things. Sometimes our pain has a purpose. I don't know how many years ago it was now, but I went to see a pastor friend of mine. And I was talking about my past and I was so burdened with my struggles and my, my, my injuries and my wounds over a lifetime and I was just laying it all out on the table and telling him how I felt and when I got finished describing my experience, the pastor looked at me and said, well, Calvin, congratulations. It sounds like a promotion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sometimes your pain is your promotion. So you don't want to run from all of your pain. Some of your pain is necessary to cause you to be and to become the person that God has designed you to be. <laughs> yeah. But Elimelech was impatient. He couldn't wait around for all of that. He hit the road with his family, running away from God's destiny, only to find God's destiny in a foreign land. text says that after he died, Naomi was left with her two sons, a widow with no power, and back then women had no rights. And so she's in a foreign land as a widow with two sons, no rights and no way of getting along. And so how will they deal with this loss? How does Naomi and her sons interpret this experience? We moved from there, running away from death, and we moved over here, and daddy died, and husband died. Oh, my God. Famine over there, and death over here. What's going on? How did they interpret this? Well, verse 4 tells us how the sons interpret it. The sons took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of the one was Orpah. The name of the other was Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years. 
the sudden death of Elimelech did not raise any alarms for them. <laughs> Didn't cause them to reinterpret anything. They, oh, dad's, get, dad's dead. I'm going to get married. They did not discern in Elimelech's death any sign of God's displeasure with his decision. They were spiritually deaf. And if any one of them, either son or mother, if any one of them had any misgivings about leaving the promised land to go and live in this foreign land, this was the perfect time to reset, to change their mind, to change their direction, to pack their bags and head back to Israel. But they settled for the status quo. It's called status quo bias. It refers to our tendency to stick with what we know instead of choosing something new or something different. Even if we believe that the change could benefit us, we're stuck in the status quo. We're afraid of any change. And so they remain even after daddy is gone and they marry women. Now, Elimelech, their father, had the opposite problem. He was, he, he was not, not, not averse to risk at all. He took big risk in moving from Israel. But his sons now, they're afraid to risk going back to Israel. They're settled in their ways. They've dug in. Mm. They remain in their place. And not only did they remain in Moab, they settled down. They have no intentions of going back to Israel. They've taken Moabite, Moabite wives. They intend to become a part of that society. They have given up on all thought of going back to Bethlehem. It is easier for me to understand Elimelech's decision, his choice. Because at least Elimelech can say, I was under pressure. And in the heat of the moment, I made my decision. Sometimes I got it wrong. I can kind of understand Elimelech's situation, but I cannot relate to his son's choices to stay in Moab. If any of them felt like they were on the wrong side of God in moving there, this was their perfect opportunity to make it right. But the sons dug in even deeper. You all know the first law of holes. There's a proverb that says, if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. But Malone and Chilion didn't stop digging. They kept digging. They committed to a bad decision. And they paid a price for it in verse 5. It says that both Malone and Chilion also died. Whoa, this book starts off with famine and death. Famine and funerals. The two sons die. Calamity after calamity. And at this point, one does begin to wonder whether God is actually angry at this family. This is certainly an unusual turn of events for any one family in such a short period of time. Elimelech made his decision in good faith. It was a very practical, but not a very spiritual decision. It was his choice. It was a normal human response to tragedy. Then his sons maintained the status quo out of their complacency. And their decision has left Naomi without her two sons and without her husband in a foreign land. Trying to avoid any inconvenience and trying to avoid any tests or trials will always land you in a situation that is worse than the one you were hoping to avoid. Let me ask you the question today. Are you living under pressure? Are you living under the threat of imminent loss? Do you find yourself at the beginning of this year facing difficult circumstances at home, at work, in your personal life. I recommend to you today that you do not take the path of least resistance. Maybe it's time for you finally to face your own giants and not run from every fight, saving it for another day. Maybe it's time for you to stand up 
and hold your ground. Maybe God has destined you to go through this fire and not around it. And if God has destined you to go through the fire, you will not be able to outrun it. So instead, do these five things. Number one, if you're under pressure, consult God and ask for direction. Do not make any decision, do not commit to any decision until you hear from God. Number two, do not lean on your own understanding. Some situations are more complicated than you may realize. Do not depend on your own mother wit, your own common sense, your own wisdom. Number three, do not be afraid to entertain the idea that maybe some of your past decisions were wrong and you need to change course. Don't be afraid to admit that. Don't be ashamed to say, you know what, I made a bad decision. I made a bad choice. I repent. Number four, do not allow pressure to force you to make choices before you are ready. Do not allow pressure to force you to make decisions while your mind is clouded and your judgment is paralyzed. Be still. And finally, number five, remember this quote from Jim Elliott. God always gives his best to those who leave the choices with him. God always gives his best to those who leave the choices to him. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this year, another year, another day. We celebrate our lives, we celebrate our lessons. We celebrate our good days and we celebrate our bad days. Father, we come to you this morning praying for wisdom. You said in your word that if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God and that you would give us wisdom liberally. Many of us today in this very moment are faced with pressures and struggles and challenges, perplexities. And we're struggling, Lord God, to know what your will is in this season for our lives. And we are tempted, Lord God, to just run away from our problems and to start anew, to reset our entire lives, to give up on everything that we've built so far and start again. I pray, Lord God, that we will not yield to these temptations but that in 2024, we will stand our ground, that we will stake our claim, that we will trust in you through the darkness, that will allow you to have your way in our lives. Teach us your ways and teach us your will and give us hearts to follow wherever you lead. And this is our choice in Jesus' name. Amen. for the first communion of the year. It's our uh, hope as a worship team that this song would help us do that. Pray. 
precious blood has left me forgiven Pure like the whitest of snow Powerful to make sin and shame retreat This covenant is making me service that we call the Believer's Communion, an opportunity for us to obey the command of Jesus Christ to remember him in the eating of bread and drinking of wine, to do these things in remembrance of him as an acknowledgement of his crucifixion, of his suffering, and of his death on our behalf, to give thanks to his name and to glorify him for his great sacrifice for us. It's called the Believer's Communion because this command was left on record for the followers of Jesus Christ. And I ask you the question today, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Have you confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you believe that Jesus Christ has died and risen physically and bodily from the dead? And that by his name and by his blood, you can be set free. If you believe that today and you haven't already, and you confess it with your mouth, God promises that you will be saved, that you will be transformed by the power of his Holy Spirit, and that you will have newness of life. I invite you today, if you have not yet received Jesus Christ, to deeply consider whether God is speaking into your heart in this moment. And if so, I pray that you would answer yes. And for the rest of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, this is an opportunity for us now to evaluate our own lives, to examine ourselves, and to confirm whether or not we are in the faith, whether or not we have been faithful to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and to confess those things that may not be pleasing in his sight, to prepare ourselves to partake of communion. Take a moment now to reflect. Over the past week, over the past month, to reflect upon your disposition and your attitudes. And if you see anything that would be displeasing to God, to confess those things to him 
in this silent moment. And afterwards, I'll close us in prayer. Father and our God, we come to you confessing that our hearts are prone to wander, and that we are prone to leave the God that we love. So often and unintentionally we fall into sin, into bad habits from our past. We confess, Lord God, that more often than not, we allow our flesh to dictate and to direct our lives and our decisions. And we repent to you right now. We change our minds. And we conclude that it's better to follow your will than to be self-willed. It's better to submit to your guidance, your instruction, and your direction and to follow our own minds or the philosophies of this dying world. Cleanse us right now from all unrighteousness. Forgive us for all of our sins. Prepare us to celebrate your crucifixion as we look forward to the resurrection of the dead when we will see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. Because of Jesus, my heart is slain. So I will run, lift my hands. Without his mercy, my life was spent. The highest name has set me free. Because of Jesus, my heart is clean. Mm -hmm. For I receive from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus Christ, we do remember and we do celebrate the choice that you made the choice to sacrifice your own life on our behalf. We thank you so much for what you've done for us, the, the, the life that you have bought for us. Thank you for newness of life. Thank you for peace in your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the joy that you place deep down in our souls. We are forever grateful and indebted to you. Help us to make the right choice. 
give it to us to have hearts of humility where we too would make the choice to suffer for the cause of Jesus Christ our Lord. It's in his name we pray. Amen. the offering. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us. And we pray this morning as we return a portion back, may it be mightily used for your kingdom, for your purposes. And Father, we ask that it would also be our act of worship, our act of submission. And remembering that everything we have comes from you. May you be pleased with our giving. In our Savior's name we pray, amen. I'd like to ask the congregation to stand and let's uh, worship together and respond to God in one more song today.
amazing takes me home I'll trust in you sing that chorus one more time I will live I will live to love you I will live to bring you praise I'll live child in all of you. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. In Jesus' name, you're dismissed. <coughs> Until I see you face to face.